right, let's go ahead and begin this morning. So glad to see all of you here today. This is a special day for our seniors. It's our Honor of the Graduate Sunday. And looking forward to what God's going to have for us in a special time for each one of our seniors. Let's start by seeing number 395, Standing on the Promises. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, we can trust the Lord to keep His promises, what He says in His Word. And let's go ahead and stand as we sing Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. We'll sing all the verses. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Standing on the promises of God. Verse 2. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. of God on the last standing on the promises I cannot fall listening every moment to the Spirit's call resting in my Savior as my all in all standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Our God is faithful. Let's try it again. Our God is faithful. faithful. He sure is. Let's say our verse together for the year, 2 Thessalonians 3, 3 through 5. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Just a couple of uh, reminders for you. We have uh, several graduates that we're honoring today in our service. They're having open houses, and uh, they're in your bulletin. They're also on the back window, uh, the office window, as you head out today. But we're counting on you at our house, and so I hope, I know the mayors probably are too, and others, so make sure you make note of those and uh, plan to attend those this week. Let's bow together for prayer. Thank you, God, that you are a faithful you are unchanging. There is nothing about you today that's different than it was yesterday or will be tomorrow. I thank you that we can rest in you. We can be confident in you in the gospel. The good news that Jesus Christ came to save is still stands and is still powerful. And we pray that today it would go forth from this place, that hearts would be open and tender to your truth and those who are not saved would be saved. We're grateful for the graduates and the special day to honor them. I pray that today that our eyes would be fixed on you and as well as a church we commit to be praying for these young people and the next stages they have in their life. Father, meet with us now in this hour. Fill pastor with your Holy Spirit and give the message to us that we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. The faithfulness of God. Let's sing our chorus for the year. Our God is faithful. Our God is faithful, our God is real, steadfast and true, with power to heal, in every weakness we find Him strong. Fit. 
Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. A uh, couple things here. Uh, get my note open. Uh, we have next next Sunday is our annual business meeting, and that will be after the evening service. And uh, I want you to pull that uh, photo up there, Tyler and Casey Trometer. Okay, you see their picture up there. Um, they uh, are going for short term. They're going to be six months on the field helping. Uh, they're actually taking the place of their parents. We support the trometers, and uh, they're coming back for six months. And so Tyler and Casey are going to be six month, six month furlough replacement. And so I just want you to be uh, think about that and praying about that. We're going to request that uh, our church would would pay for one month, and uh, they are they're under GFA Gospel Fellowship Association. They're just replacing their parents for uh, they're doing six months. We want to pay for one month, which would be thirty nine hundred dollars, and we have that in extra on the faith promise. So we're just saying well, that that was extra. We'll just go ahead and send them a one-month payment for the six months. One, one, one of those six months we pay for. So we want you to be praying about that, be aware of that, and that is uh, going to be included with uh, the budget uh, information next Sunday night. Uh, and then all of the new missionaries that were here, we have recommendation to take them on as well. And so that's, uh, those are some things to be aware of. And if you have questions about, feel free to come talk to us about it. But we want to let you have that update, know that that was on there. And then uh, I hope that you'll stay and be with us for the luncheon. We're going to have a luncheon here today, and we're going to honor our graduates during that luncheon. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to have the luncheon, then we have a, a service in the afternoon right back there in the um, fellowship hall. We'll have the luncheon there, and then we'll have the service there, and we're going to recognize our seniors there. And so uh, we have uh, gifts for them, and we want to uh, ask you to stay and be a part of that. And then the other announcements that you can see, they're here in the bulletin, and uh, please make note of them. We're excited about the faith promise. God is continuing to bring uh, funds in on that, and uh, we're ahead of what we were last year at this time in terms of uh, trusting the Lord to bring that in. So keep praying for us, praying in that situation, uh, and praying for our missionaries. Thanks for being here this morning. Summer camp is just about a month away, a little more than a month away, June 20th through the 25th, and looking forward to it. We still have a need for one more camper uh, that would like support and help financially to get to camp, so if you can help with that, so see me afterwards, and that would be great. Uh, let's go to 421 in our hymn books, the higher ground we should be striving for, uh, knowing the Lord better each and every day. Uh, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of higher ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher. No. 
before us, and we need the Lord's help to continue on. Thank you, choir, for that reminder. Let's go to 404. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. 404. And uh, we are the Lord's if we're believers. Let's go ahead and stand one more time. The choir will come down and join you on the main floor here. I am thine, O Lord. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer. Thy precious bleeding side, consecrate, consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by thy power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me The cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. We'll sing verse 3 as the last, and as we sing the third verse, we'll have the children depart for children's church. On the third, oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. To thy precious bleeding side. Great singing, you may be seated. I 
precious Holy Spirit, fill and control. Give me wisdom and strength, grant that I may be a mirror of your never. And that ought to be all of our prayers, shouldn't it? Lord, send me. All right. So good to see you here this morning. How many of you would just be able to, right now, think in your, thinking in your life, you'd be able to say, God has blessed me. If that's true, say amen. amen. God has blessed me. I'm blessed of God. You know, uh, we have reason to rejoice because of God, who He is. Our joy should be in the Lord. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. Our strength comes from the Lord. And so we look at Him and we realize that He's at work. He's rejoice. We want to rejoice in Him. We want to be thankful to Him. I want you to open your Bibles to probably one of the most uh, maligned books in the Bible. A book that is misunderstood. It's a book that uh, has been described as uh, humanistic. And uh, it's really a wonderful book. It's a book that was written and it is inspired of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And you say, what book is he talking about? It's an Old Testament book. It's an Old Testament book that was written for us to understand life. In fact, I believe that this book was written in such a way that if you get the, if you get the scope of it, that you will have a greater understanding of God because of that. You'll understand God in a way you didn't understand Him before. Does anybody know what book I'm talking about? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. All right, turn in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Somebody said Song of Solomon. That would be a good one too, but Ecclesiastes. All right, uh, Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I want you to turn to the third chapter. This week... Well, at the beginning of next week, I'll, I will be 70 years old. I am officially an old man. But I want you to know something. I have a wonderful life. God has given me a wonderful life. I, I am excited about the gift of life. I don't know if you are, but I'm excited about the gift of life, that what God has given to us and, and what He's blessed us with. I, I want you to think about that because... I've entitled the message this morning, A Theology of Life. A Theology of Life. Now, the word theology means study of God. 
So, I want you to note with me this morning that Ecclesiastes was written so that you would have a God view of life. God's view of life. Not man's view, but God's view. And so we're, we're, we want you to think in, in terms of, of God's view. Now, I chose this text today because of the seniors, because of the young people here, because uh, we're honoring them, and, and I want them to uh, really get a view of life that makes a difference. You stop and think about it and realize that God, God wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to understand life. He wants us to be able to, to go through life with a concept that makes a difference. Now, here's a God-given philosophy of life. Listen to it. I'll say it a couple times. Recognizing that life is temporary and God is eternally real is the secret to enjoying life as the gift of God. I'll say it again. Recognizing that life is temporary. You and I are going to only be here a little while, right? It's temporary. And that God is eternally real is the secret to enjoying life as a gift of God. Now, King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. He uses God in the book 40 times. 40 times he mentions God. Spread out throughout the, the, the chapters of, Ecclesi of Ecclesiastes. His choice of vocabulary is for God, it's Elohim. And his choice for man is the Hebrew for Adam. And our focus, we focus our attention here and realize that God's relationship with man is something that God wants to have. He wants to have a relationship with you. Do you believe that? God wants to have a relationship with you. And so we look at this and, and begin to understand it. Our text this morning, beginning with chapter 3 and verse, verse 11. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he has set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it and that men should fear before him. Two principles, just basic principles at the outset. Number one, God has given us everything we have that is good. Verses 11, 12 and 13. Everything that you have that's good comes from who? Comes from God. And secondly, God always, God, God's ways are eternal and they need no changing. You don't need to, when God does it, it, it's done. And what he does, he does eternally. And it's for our good. And so God is involved in this. This, this book declares the philosophy of life. The, the worldview that ought to govern life, even if you are a believer or an unbeliever, you need to have this worldview that God is the creator of all things. You believe that? Secondly, these are, these are four truths. We'll only probably cover two of them. But in this book, God is the all-powerful creator. That's number one. Number two, God is the wise sovereign. He is sovereign in all that takes place. He's wise. Number three, 
God is the infallible judge. We're all going to stand before God. We'll give an account to God. He's the infallible judge. Whatever he does, he does right. And the last one is, God is the supreme reality. If you want to live a real life, you have to live your life in connection with God. If you leave God out, you are fooling yourself. You're not li really living if you leave God out. Now, thinking about that and, and considering that, Ecclesiastes, when you start with a, just a simple reading of it, you can begin to think, um, man, life isn't worth living at all. Because one of the words that shows up in Ecclesiastes over and over again is vanity. He says, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. And what Solomon did, he, you know, I, I think this is probably uh, a little bit of a stretch, but Solomon had all the wealth that he needed to do anything he wanted to do. He would be an Elon Musk of today. Okay? Uh, but he had more wisdom than Elon Musk. God gave him wisdom. Now, we look at his life and we say he, he, he left some of that wisdom off. Uh, in his pursuit of trying to figure life out from, from a, a vertical perspective, he left some things out. Uh, I don't know how wise it is to have 700 wives. And yeah, 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 I don't know how wise that is. Um, but the reality is they turned his heart away from God. When you study his life, you see that they turned his heart away. And so if he had kept God in his perspective, things would have changed. He would have, he would have finished well. And so um, we're going to look at his, this book from that perspective. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we need your presence here this morning. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And Lord, we need the joy of the Lord. We need your presence. We need to be able to recognize that you're at work in our midst here. Lord, I pray that you would calm our hearts, that we could be open and receptive to what you have for us. Your word, your presence, your wisdom, your knowledge is better than any that we would have. And so give us ears to hear, allow your Holy Spirit to speak to us, use your word in a, in a powerful way. Lord, I pray for these uh, high school graduates and college graduates that are here today, Lord, would you bless and encourage them? Would you help them to see life from, from your perspective? Would you help them to get a theology of life that would, would keep you at the very center? And Lord, would you help us who have uh, come to places of maturity in our age, to be mature spiritually. Work in us, Lord. Help us. Help our church. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise for it, for you're worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. God is the powerful creator. That's number one. God is the powerful creator. Through, throughout so, Scripture, God is, God's creative works are testified to. You can't, you can't get away from that. If you read the Bible, you have to come to the conclusion that God is, is powerful, that He's wise, that He is to get the glory, and that He created everything. Now, I, I wrote a statement down here. Only God has the power and ability to create out of nothing. Now, we have, we have people that create wonderful works of art, create amazing things. You, you know, we're, we're, we're living in uh, an, an age of amazing inventions. But you know all of those things are a reflection of the fact that God made you in his image? If you have the ability to create, it's because God made you that way. 
and man's ability to, to investigate, to create, and to do things is because of God. We are made in the image of God, and because we're in the image of God, we're able to think, and we're able to plan, and we're able to put things together, and it's God that makes that possible. It's so important for us to understand that. There's hardly a more basic theological truth than the fact that God is creator. The inescapable implication of this basic truth, then, is if God made us, then we are accountable to him. We have a responsibility before him to admit that we belong to the Lord by virtue of our creating, being created by him, will in amazing ways change your understanding of life and the way that you approach it. And so this morning, would you, would you that are sitting here, would you think about this and say, I believe, would you be able to say, I believe that God created everything. You, you ought to be able to come to that conclusion. I believe that God is the creator of everything. Now, that being the case, he made everything. Look at chapter 11 and verse 5. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb for of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who, what does it say? Maketh all. He's the maker of all. And, and so he says, you, you don't know how God works all this, in, but he made it all. Totally, everything God made. Colossians 1 and verse 16, listen to it. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Think about the vastness of creation. You think about the number of stars and all of those things. And then think back to the details of creation. Think about the, the detail. Uh, think about your eye. The amazing thing of an eye that communicates with a brain, that gives you an image, and you, you stop and think, the ability for you to see is an amazing thing. And, and it's so intricate, and, and it's amazing that God has allowed us as human beings to understand so much, and we live in an amazing day when they can go in and clean out your blood vessels and put a stent in, and, you're, you're, and they can fix your heart and change a, a valve in your heart, and, and you can live and keep living. You stop and think about all of those things. Where did that come from? Well, it came from God who gave man that ability. And it ought to draw us to, to understanding that there is a creator. And he, he, he creates with design and purpose. And we ought to understand that. To believe, now listen, folks. To believe that this world is the work of some chance and aimless evolutionary chaos that came out of chaos and came into order. To believe that, to think about that, is like wandering blindly through life and without any purpose, and, and where am I going to end up? There, there, folks, is there any wonder that we live in a culture that has young people as, at the age of 18 going around killing other people indiscriminately? Is there any wonder about that? Because they don't believe that there's a God? They don't believe that God created all? They don't believe that they're accountable to God and they're frustrated with life. How important it is for us to come back to this and understand that God is the creator and that we have a responsibility to him. We, we see a, a group of people, a, a culture that has tried to leave God out. You cannot leave God out. On the other hand, if you believe that the world is made by God, that he's the powerful creator, he's the foundation. It, it gives you a foundation of reason. It gives you a, a concept of logic. It causes you to realize that there's a purpose for everything. And you come back to that and say, God is the maker of everything. But now, secondly, not only is God, he's creator of everything. He's the powerful creator. He's creator of everything. But he is the 
creator of man. You were created by God. Genesis' account of the original creation reveals that although man shares many things with all the other creation, we are very different than all other creation because we are created in the image of God. We're created in the image of God. You stop and think about it. We are, we are the, the supreme example of God's creation. We, we are spiritual. We are ultimately uh, immortal. You're going, to, you're going to live forever or exist forever someplace. Either it's with God in heaven or it's separated from God, but you're going to exist. You are immortal once you come into this world. You're going to, you're going to be existing with intellect, emotion, and will, created in original righteousness, holiness and knowledge and dominion over the rest of creation. That's how God made you. A proper view of life must recognize that man is personally accountable to his creator. You are personally accountable to your creator. You're going to give an account to God. The preacher after, and that's Solomon, The preacher, after lamenting the deplorable state of humanity in general, look at chapter 7 and and looking at verse 25. He said, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and to reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this I have found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out this, the account which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. And he's, he's disgusted with what he's searched out and what he's found. But then notice what he says in verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. You know what he says? I, I realize that God made us righteous. He made us tr- to be morally pure and true. He made us that way. But man has gone after all these other things and, and messed his life up. And, and that's what, that's what this, the writer is saying, the preacher is saying. And you know it's still true today. Now listen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Listen to what it says. It says, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You know, sin spoiled creation. The curse came on all of us. We come into this world sinners. But when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what are you? You're a new creature. You've been born again. And he says, you need to live that way. You need to put on the new man. You need to live with after God in, in the creation of his righteousness. Look at chapter 3 again in verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Now I want you to notice the next phrase. Also he has set the world in their heart. He has set the world in their heart. What does that mean, setting the world in their heart? Well, it's interesting when you go back to the Hebrew and begin to look at this this. Uh, word in the Hebrew, and I'd, I just have to look at the, the Hebrew dictionaries. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but in the concordance and, and in the Strong's, it says this. It, it means vanishing point, generally time out of mind. It, it means future. And then it also is, is translated this way in other places, always ancient, and any more continuing, eternal, everlasting, So if we put that all together, what he's saying is that God has set eternity in our hearts. In other words, we know that there's something more to life than this. We know there's something after this life. How many of you believe that there's something beyond this life? Amen? You believe that? Why? God put that in you. God put it in you to know that there's something beyond this life. He set the world, he set eternity in their heart. There is something about man that will be forever 
and cannot therefore be satisfied with the temporal things. A little more stuff, a little more money, a little more of this doesn't satisfy. You've got to have something that is eternal, that connects with your eternal being, and you need God. It's part, it's part of sin to ignore the Creator. That's, that's sin. One, Satan and the world and sin take you away from God. The preacher's investigation of life has experienced revealed that the more man followed his own imaginations in trying to find meaning and purpose and satisfaction in life, the further he removed himself from the very things he was pursuing. Where do you find meaning in life? You find it in God. You find it in your Creator. Now, listen, God made everything. God made man. When you read the Bible, you need to make it practical. How many of you would be able to say with me, God made me? Can you say that? God made me. Oh, God made you. God made you. What did he make you for? He made you for himself. Look at chapter 12. And verse 1. Chapter 12 and verse 1. Remember now, what's the next word? Thy creator. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. You know, in the days of your youth, Remember thy creator. What is that? Thy creator. It's, it's personal. He created you. Remember him. Remembering, now listen, remembering is an act of the will. It's an act of the will. It means to con consciously bring something to mind, to make oneself think about something on purpose. And so he says, I want you to purposely think about your creator. You know, cr Christian philosophy of life requires that every believer bring to bear on the issues of life the fact that God made him. You're required, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are required to recognize that God is your maker. And the implication is that it's personal. It's, it's for you personally. You need to take into account what God has for you. Trying to be satisfied outside of God won't work. But if you seek to satisfy God, then you'll become satisfied. Our existence is not an accident. Nor we're not just a biological phenomenon. We didn't just uh, come here by uh, accident. You know what the Bible says? Psalm 139, verse 14, it says, We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Made. When God made us according to his pleasure, he did a good job. You know what he said? he said? He said, when he made men, he said, it's good. It's good. God made us, and he made us good. No need to question or fret over how he made us. We're accountable to him. And you know, he doesn't make everybody the same. In fact, he makes us all different. Makes us all different. You know where we get into trouble? We are, when we start looking at others and thinking we should be like them. I wish I was tall. I wish I was short. You know, I wish I, 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 wish I had a different color hair. I wish I, I was this or that. And, and we, we stop and forget that God made us the way we are for his glory. Mr. Bedrusi, I think if I said it right, but the, the man that today is a motivational speaker who was born with no arms and no legs. No arms and no legs. He's married. He goes around speaking to young people about life. And his point is that God made him the way he is. And he can enjoy life. There was a time in his life, I read his story, there was a time in his life when he, he, tried, to, he tried to kill himself, tried to drown himself in, in the bathtub. 
but he couldn't do it. it. It didn't work. And he came to realize that God didn't make a mistake when he made him. God made him for a purpose. Every one of us has a purpose. And you stop and think about that. You know, there are no lesser of God's creation wishing that they had been made differently. It's only human beings who have issues with God about the way that God made us. And we need to accept that God made us the way he did for his glory. And we can trust him. Do you believe that? God made you. Now, point number two, God is the powerful creator. Point number two, God is the wise sovereign. He's the wise sovereign. This is such a life-affecting truth. He preserves and rules us. Providence is the constant and ordinary work of God whereby he preserves and governs his creation to, de to the designed end for his glory. He creates and he then has a purpose. Briefly, sovereign providence of God is the very opposite of fatalism. It's the very opposite of fatalism. You know, the fatalist says, fatalist says, well, whatever will be, will be. I can't change anything. It's going to be the way it is going to be. But that's the very opposite of God's providence because God's providence means that God has a purpose and a plan and he's working it all together for good to those who what? Love him and are called according to his purpose. It's not blind chance. It's not just happening. Look in your Bibles to, to chapter 9. Ecclesiastes 9, look at verse 1. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. It's in the hand of God. He said, he says, I consider this. It's in the hand of God. Not only are the affairs of life in God's hands, but his purpose and his plan is in God's hand. Look at verse 14 of chapter 3. Notice what he says. It's a declarative statement in verse 14. I know, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. I know that whatsoever God does, having the constant awareness of God, that is the fear of the Lord. You're aware of God. You know he's in, in control. It puts a spiritual perspective on everything that goes on in life. I'm looking at it from God's perspective. And we need to do that. Now, when you think about that, when you consider that, and you consider the providence of God, and you understand that God's in control of everything, then there are three things that, that show up that make it very important. God determines my time. How much time do you have? The time that God gives you. Amen? That's all you have, the time that God gives you. Does God have, does God have time for everything that you need to do? Has he given you that time? If you need to do it, has God given you the time? You ever say, I don't have enough time? You ever said that? I, I have all these things I need to do, and I don't have the time. Wait a minute. Who's in control of your time? God gave it to you. God has a purpose. I want you to look back at chapter 3 and verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. That prophet, what prophet hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I've seen the travail of God, which God hath given to the sons of men, to be exercised in it. You know, he makes everything beautiful. 
in its time. Now, you think about what we just read. Literary genius set out in these verses. You stop and think about it. There is a time and a purpose for everything that happens. And when you look at all of this, he's putting it all together. There are 14, 14, 14, 14 pairs. Okay, can't do it with my fingers. Don't have enough. 14 pairs. 28 specific times. 28 specific times. And those times are all with a purpose. God has a purpose for all of those times. And you stop and think about God in his purposes, in his plans. The will of God takes in the times for absolutely everything. All occasions of life are a part of divine order. All kinds of times. Now you think about it, high school, high school graduate. Big question. What are you going to do now? What's next? You know, what's your next step? What are you going to do? You, you look at the high school graduates and... and they have an idea, or they don't. Sometimes they don't have an idea. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm planning to go to college. I'm planning to get a job. I'm planning, college graduate, to get married, right? Boy, a smile come on Josiah's face there. He's, he's looking forward to that. You know, what do we do? We take steps. But who's in control? God is. Who are we trusting? God. Have you ever planned to get five things done in a day and only get two of them done? Or only one of them? Or maybe none of them? You ever been there? And you say, well, what's the use of planning? Oh, wait a minute. You take it to God. You say, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm going to give these to you, and if it's in your will, I, I will get them done today. But you're in charge. I'm trusting you. And God directs our path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? He'll direct your path. I started out in engineering school but I finished in Bible school. God changed my path. He changed my path. You stop and think about it. I dated a few girls, but I'm glad I stopped dating a few girls <laughs> and got the right one. God's in control, amen? Amen. Uh, and, and you stop and you look at that and you say, okay, God is in control. God determines the times. He determines my circumstances. Do you believe that God determines your circumstances, that he's the one that's in control of everything? You're going to mow the lawn and then the storm comes. Praise the Lord. I don't have to mow today. You know, or... It passed over. Praise the Lord, I get to mow today. You know, you, you, the circumstances. We look at God and we say, God is in control, and we trust him. Now listen. When someone you love dies, it's amazing how people approach that. Some people are stoic. They don't want to cry. They're just, but listen to me. There's a time to weep. There's a time to weep. It's okay to cry. It's okay to realize that someone I love is gone. But if they know the Lord, I can rejoice because I'll see them again. You see, see, God wants to control our lives from the standpoint of us trusting him in every situation. God's in control of this too, and we recognize that. Sorrow, we sorrow. 
But how do we sorrow? Not as those that have no hope. We sorrow because we know that God's in control. He determines our circumstances. The preacher over and over identifies the many gifts that God has given his people for their good. And he talks about that in in chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And that also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. You know what? We're, We're going to enjoy a fellowship time. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to sitting around a table with folks and eating some food and having fellowship. And what am I going to do? We're going to enjoy it. Why? Because it's a gift from God. It's a part of life. And you stop and think about what does God do? Live joyfully. Look at chapter 9 and verse 9. Chapter 9 and verse 9. What does he say in verse 9? He says, live joyfully with the life, with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy, of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is the portion in this life and in the labor which thou takest under the sun. The, the statement, live joyfully, literally means see life. See life. See life is from God. See life as an experience that we're to to enjoy. God has made us to be social beings. We need one another. And that's what brings joy into our lives as we spend time with people that we love. And he says, live joyfully. See life as a gift from God. See that God has put it there for your purposes and for your blessings. The illogical extension is, that it's only by God's grace that any of that works. You see it is from God. He controls our circumstances. You see it is from God. And you recognize that God has to be involved in it. It doesn't take much experience to live uh, in living to realize how important the family is. I've been reading a couple articles just this last week about the reset. What what they're trying to do in our world. And there's two main things. They want to eliminate Christianity and they want to eliminate the family. Why? Because those are two stabilizing forces in any culture. And they want to tell you what to think and what to do and they want to take away your liberty. You need to come back and realize, no, God is in control. And God controls our, he's sovereign. And he controls our circumstances. And he determines everything. He's in charge. He's the one. He gives you a job to work. And you know, you ought to enjoy the job that you have. A lot of people don't enjoy work. They don't enjoy the work that they have. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're a housewife, you're a factory worker, you're a police officer, you're a pastor, Whatever you're doing, you ought to do it to the glory of God and let God be praised in what you're doing because he determines those things. Now, he determines everything for your good and my good. That's the bottom line. The Christian view of life trusts that the Lord, that he, ha- he knows and he does what is best for his people. That the Lord regards his people as special and treats them di- differently than sinners who do not know him. We have a special relationship with God. Amen? Do you, do you talk to him? Do you pray to him? Do you realize? Do, do, you, do you ever come away from prayer and just feel happy? Just, just say, boy, it sure was good to be with God today. sure was good to talk to him and let him talk to me. It sure was good to read his word. It's just so good to, to be in his presence. In thy presence is, what's the Bible say? Fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. Look at chapter 2 and verse 26. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 26. For God giveth to a man that is good in his 
sight, wisdom, and knowledge, and, what does it say? Joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. You know, he says, he says, God deals with people differently. And, you know, God is good to everybody, but if you're not, if you're not going to acknowledge God and you don't want anything to do with God, then God is going to deal with you differently. He is going to deal with you differently. And God wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to understand that. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 14. There's a juxtapositioning here. I want you to see what he says in chapter 7 and verse 14. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. God also has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. And what he's saying is, you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. True? You have good days and bad days. And he puts the one over the other. And the satisfaction isn't about how good my day was or how bad my day was, but how good my God is. That's where the focus is. It's on God. Listen, folks, on the worst day, God's still in control. God's still on the throne. And God still loves you. Young people, if you'll keep God in perspective, if you'll seek after the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll let him be the Lord of your life, you will be able to enjoy the gift of life. A theology of life. Keep God in the very center and let God have his way in everything that you do. God is the powerful creator. He made everything. He made man. He made me. God is the wise sovereign. He determines the times. He determines my circumstances. And he determines everything that comes into my life. He either allows it or disallows it. God's in control. To God be the glory. And then, I, I don't have time to preach these two, but God is the infallible judge and you're going to give account to him someday. And God is the supreme reality. If you want a real life, you have to know the real Savior, Jesus Christ. You have to know him. Why did, what did he say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Would you bow your heads for prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we need your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding. Lord, we need to recognize that you are the supreme, all-powerful creator. That you're the one that can, can change our lives so that we can love life and enjoy you. Lord, you're the one who has made it available to us to have our sins forgiven and to have a right relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that you would work in every heart here today, that, that we would be honest with you and we would recognize that you have a right to our lives. You are our creator. And Lord, we have, we have the privilege of coming to you and trusting you and knowing you and loving you and serving you. And we have the privilege of knowing that that's the way to blessing. Father, I praise you and thank you for what you're going to do. Pray for every young person that you would help them to purpose in their heart today that they're going to remember you in the days of their youth. They're going to continue to live for you and set the habits and the patterns in place that will cause them to seek after you daily. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that we would recognize that it's a part of what makes life real is you. And I pray you'd have your way in every heart and life. Help us be honest with you. Help us realize you have an answer. 
there's someone here today, Lord, that does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray that they would come to you as their Creator and seek you as their Savior, and they would receive new life. Lord, I pray that you'd have your way, and we'll give you the praise and the thanks for it in your precious name. With your head still bowed, if there's someone here today that would say, Pastor, I Life hasn't been so good. I, I don't know the Lord as my Savior. I want to know Him as my Savior. God spoke in my heart. Is there anybody like that? You would just slip your hand up and say, that's me. That's me. I want you to pray for me. Anybody like that today? wonder if you would just have a moment with God and just tell Him how much you love Him. And then we're going to sing. Father, speak to the hearts of our people today. Speak to us for your glory. We ask it in your name. Thank you, Lord, for being my Savior. Amen. Would you turn in your hymn books to hymn number... 525, 525, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Let's stand and sing it together. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine? True and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see love of Christ so freely given grace of God beyond degree mercy higher than the heaven deeper than the deepest sea all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see.